Horse lover, riding hunter jumpers in Michigan. She is involved in many equine, farrier, and blacksmith organizations, being an active advocate for blacksmiths, farriers, and of course the horse. She is a very talented artist that uses steel as her canvas. She has built a successful career in a difficult area using blacksmithing abilities to combat the hard weather and the economy. She is rich in family and friends and a true supporter of our industry. Jennifer Horn. Thank you. You guys hear me okay like that? Okay, I'm gonna hide behind the podium since I don't get to hide behind the anvil this time. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and, and when I was thinking about why in the world have they asked me to speak, I decided that it, it must be because I've successfully made a living showing horses for 30 years now in a, in a very difficult area. The Eastern Upper Peninsula is not a high economic area. Um, the winters are long. There's, there's some challenges of the region I live in, but somehow I figured out how to make a successful farrier career for 30 years now. And part of how I did that was by continuing my education and through competition too. And competition is a great place for education. And so, let's see. Okay. Um, you know, the, the work sport, competitions are a work sport. We're taking our work and, and, and treating it somewhat as a sport in the competition. And American work sports have been around for long, hundreds of years. The later two-thirds of the 19th century is when the work sports really started to emerge. And worker competitions were common both in the workplace, factories, farms, and on the frontier. And the managers and the business owners all promoted that because the competitions actually increased the productivity and the skill level of the workers that were employed there. Point over there. Okay. This is a, the Norman Rockwell photograph of the story Heeled and Toe. If you have not seen it, you can look it up online. It was in the Saturday Evening Post. I thought I had the date here. But it's called Blacksmith Boy, Heel and Toe. And it, it's one of the best descriptions of the work sport. And the, the blacksmith had the most standard product that they were producing, the horseshoe. So what they would do is compete against other blacksmith shops. And I have it here that, um, On January 30th, 1858, a Clipper newspaper announced that Thomas Rambo made in one day 120 shoes. And at that point, it was a record. But each blacksmith shop would submit their productivity. And Robert Walsworth at a New York blacksmith shop was assigned with a striker, made 260 complete horseshoes with double punch nail holes in seven hours and 58 minutes of work time. And they took a 39 minute work break. And then four weeks later, another shop submitted 2,400 horse nails in seven hours and 54 minutes. And all of these shops encouraged the competitions. And there would be uh, a lot of times what they would call a floater who would travel from town to town and, and challenge the local blacksmith. And that's what the blacksmith boy heel and toe story is about. So what is a competition? Competitions are um, an arena where people are seeking to strive better performance and challenge each other against each other. I wish I could see the slides, but I can't. So um, I have cheat sheets and I got ahead of myself. It's a test of skill. The one with the most skill is going to be placed at the top, just as Austin was talking about earlier. And in order to have a test, you, in order to compete in a test, you have to understand the test. So contests have been around for years and years and years. William Hunting quotes in the Scientific Horse Showing, 1895, that 
the art of horseshoeing, stating, competition stimulate emulation amongst men. And he goes on to say that in the districts which have had the benefit of these competitions for many years past, horseshoeing has done best. So competitions have evolved over the years, and they bring many, many benefits for an education. It sets up an arena for education. And once we leave horseshoeing school, a lot of us don't get any further education unless we're apprenticing or ride-alongs, and, and I've enjoyed the competitions. It's an arena to challenge yourself and compare it against your peers. In, information in our industry has been handed down for years and years from one to another, and that's exactly what's going on at a, at a horseshoe competition. And it's proven that the more receptors you engage, the better you're going to retain the information. So instead of just being an observer, if you're actually using your hands and involved in the competition, you're going to retain the information even better. Observing has plenty of benefits as well. You watch how a competitor is setting up their station, how they align their tools, how they're mentally preparing their game, as, as Chad was talking about this morning, how they set up their, their timing and their heats, and what they're getting accomplished in a certain amount of time. And then if you have the opportunity to feel the horseshoes, there's a lot that you can learn. You, you won't necessarily see everything, but you can feel things that you didn't see. Watch the competitors and how, what their posture is. Listen to the hammer blows, the sounds of uh, the anvil and the shoes moving. Take notes. Practice the horseshoes before you get to a competition if you know what they are. Watch others build them in the different sequences that they build them in. And then go home and practice them again. Draw pictures. There are a lot of different levels of competition. This national competition here is going to invite a larger network and a larger crowd, a larger audience of competitors. And the larger the competition is, the greater your resources are going to be. I always competed in the local events in the, in the states that surrounded me. And all of those events where you meet friends and make networks, if I didn't have an answer, all I needed to know was somebody who did have the answer. And I could call or text any one of those people at any time, and that helps you through your daily business as well. Learning to, build, learning to build shoes helps you learn to build feet. One hand washes the other, and the better you get at building feet, the better you'll get at building shoes. When I began competing 20 years ago, it was standard that there was a certain amount of forging classes. How you placed in those forging classes then made the difference whether you would qualify for the live showing or not. And now the competitions are evolving that more and more competitions involve, uh, you don't have to qualify for the live showing, you can just sign up for it. And in Michigan, we just shoot one foot and build a specimen shoe. And, and every you don't have to enter all of the classes. If you only want to enter the live showing, you can do so. And I see some of the other competitions are using cadaver limbs as a way to take away the issue of how many horses are available. The problem is it's hard to find cadaver limbs with good feet and good confirmation to work on. Plus, cadaver limbs have a different sort of consistency than the live animal does. So there's an awful lot of benefits to a competition. Practicing at home is huge. I like to explore, experiment with different ideas, different sequences of building shoes. Um, and at home, I can do it without feeling any sort of pressure or anybody looking at what I'm doing or judging me. And I can sort of make mistakes and not feel self-conscious about it. And then when I do have problems, I can call somebody on the phone. I guess that's a later slide. I thought it was coming up. This. OK. So as I'm at home and I'm practicing my shoe piles, I try and keep them in order of how I built them. And then as um, I think Austin or Chad was talking about earlier, is I'll look at my shoes, the first one I built, in the sequence of building them and look at things that I either improved in or I got worse at and figure out how come one thing affected another and maybe I changed the order or the sequence or I, I neglected to put enough attention to one thing. And I'll, I'll lay out my shoes and I'll pretend I'm the judge and judge my own shoes against each other. 
and, and using the criteria that Chad, uh, Austin was talking about earlier. Oh, getting, I, I wish I could see it, I'm sorry. Getting together with other competitors. So shop nights, host a shop night, invite all the other farriers in your area around. I don't have any other farriers in my area, so I would be on the phone communicating to them what I was doing, what I was learning, and they'd be doing the same thing back with me. And one of the things is um, you learn to communicate a whole lot better that way. The more skills you develop by practicing for competitions, the more solutions you have when you go out into your everyday work. I put Craig's picture there because I think he's got a ton of skills and he has a ton of options then. Learning to build the shoes will help you to learn how the shoe works and understanding its use and its application. Because a lot of times we just don't apply the shoe the way it's intended. And competition will help you understand some of those things. Time management is huge, especially for a competition. But in our everyday work, when we're booking our appointments, we need to know how long will it take us to do a certain amount of work at a certain stop and, and then try and stay within those parameters. I don't wear a watch and I don't look at my clock but I know I'm on time because I, I know how long it takes for me to, to trim a pair of feet. I know how long it takes me to make a pair of shoes or, or put a set of shoes. And then, then I, if I need to schedule in a buffer time for difficult horses, if everything goes good, then I get an extra break between my stops. I don't typically set up at one stop and work in the same place all day. That's not the environment I live in. Proficiency. The more you do something, the more proficient you're going to get at it. And many people say they just don't have the time to compete. Well, let me say first that people who compete are shoeing just as many or more horses than those who um, are not competing. So you make time for the things that are important to you. And continuing my ed education and becoming proficient is important to me. And the more proficient I got, the easier my job got. I was amazed at how my skill developed how much easier my everyday work was. Nobody's ever too busy. If it's important, you'll make the time. It helps you teach your eye, just like the artistic uh, demonstration earlier. When you start looking at each element of your shoe and breaking it down to a, a toe and a fuller and a heel, and you start looking at each portion of the shoe art artistically, you can start looking at each tree and how together it fits up to become an entire forest for your horse. Winning or learning. You either win or learn, and if you win, then that's an affirmation, confirmation that what you thought was right is right. You excelled above the other at the competition. If you didn't, then you learn. You learn why you didn't place as high as the other competitors or your shoes weren't quite as nice. We're all handing on information from one to the other. The, judge, the judges are chosen because they have the ability to pass on a large amount of information to a large group at one time. And, and you get the, to be a judge by excelling at competitions and rising to the top of the, the competition field. Just like Craig and Timothy and Phil. But each and every one of us has something to learn every day, and the judges will tell you that they're learning something when they're competing as well. And we discuss how difficult it is to communicate with our clients, with veterinarians, and others that we work with. And I found that um, working with other farriers, sometimes I can struggle to communicate even with them, whether they're a competitor or not. And when I'm with other competitors, we can use competition language as somewhat of a definition. And uh, I, I can say, well, pull a clip that's similar to a certification clip or a competition clip. And it, they know exactly what I'm talking about. I was working with a carrier one time, and they said, well, go pull some clips on these shoes. And that was all the information they gave me. I went and pulled clips, certification style clips. And when I handed them to them, they said, these are not good. What do you mean they're not good? They were intended on nailing them on with a great big leather pad. Had I known that, I would have pulled a little taller clip to accommodate the pad. So there was just a breakdown in communication there. The competition 
terminology gives you a base to start with, and then you can adjust to the particular situations. So they're more than just a competition. A lot of people view a competition as some sort of ego competition, some sort of chest banging thing, and it's not. It's an education. At our competition in Michigan, uh, Shane Carter's on the top there. He was at our 40th anniversary, and, and we had a whole bunch of cadaver limbs brought in, and we boiled both capsules off, off the, the coffin bones. And we looked at the coffin bones, the shapes of them, the conformation of the, of the cadaver limb, and how any distortion was affecting the hook. And I've never seen that before. We've got Henry, Paul, uh, Henry Detweiler down on the left, or right. We had him do a, a safety and shoeing and a, a shoeing stop. We have lectures and presentations. And then on the far right, we screw around a little bit. We have some camaraderie and fun, and we, we develop these friendships and challenge each other in some fun, fun games as well. Competitions offer opportunity for innovation. We rely highly on our sponsors to help us put on these educational events. And the sponsors, in turn, get an opportunity to attend the event they can market their new products to us. They can show us, explain them to us. We can also question them about them and we can give them feedback about products maybe that we've used and, and had either good or bad success with. Profitability. Once you've pushed yourself and you've fine-tuned your skills, your everyday shoeing will reflect that. Your work will begin to command a higher um, price as well as you find yourself working for better people all the while. And unfortunately, there's no shortcut to this. You have to put in your time, you have to work hard, you have to shoot a lot of horses and, and competing. And if you do both, you'll excel faster. There's nothing to hold you back from accomplishing that if you put in the time and effort. Traveling is one of my favorite things. I love to travel and it's a it's a lot of fun for me to travel, and I like seeing different places, and I like meeting different people, and meeting different farriers, and manufacturers, and suppliers, and then in turn, it all comes back to putting more money in my pocket. So what exactly are they judging? You have to understand the test, just like Austin was talking about earlier, if you intend to succeed with it. So the test of the competition is to employ the skills that you can then take and adapt into your everyday work. And the competitions provide an agenda to develop those skills that we take to work every day. So the live shoeing event, which is what we're doing, is live shoeing when we go to work, has three different areas. First you trim, just like certification, you have a trim evaluation, then you build your shoe, and you have your shoe origin fit, and then your finish and nailing. And the same thing when I go to work, I try and think about all of these categories in my head while I'm working. I pick up my knife and the first thing I'm gonna do is trim my frog and I think about the score on, on a competition. Not that that's the first thing listed though, the first thing, if the scores, that last slide, that were, those were AFA score sheets, but I'm not sure if there's been any modifications to them uh, recently. So anterior posterior angle is one of the things that looked at. If you're doing pairs of feet, do they match? Is the angle of the hook equal to the angle of the pastern? But in my everyday work, I want to know, does that mean when the foot's loaded or when both feet are on the ground? And so I'll pick up one foot and look at that view and I'll look at them with both feet squared up and see if there's a significant difference between the two and if it's something I need to address when I continue on with the job. I think it's really important to not only view the horse laterally for AP balance, but I look at the bottom of the foot and think about that AP balance and where the bearing surface on the foot is. This is um, a job when I was on a ride along that we were arguing over toes and whether toes should be fit or whether they should be pointy or backed up or bolded. And, and this was a hind shoe, obviously. If you look at the photograph on the right and the burn, and you compare that burn to where the center of the horse's foot is in the bridge or ducat stout or whatever reference point you're gonna use across the, the widest point of the foot, and you compare that to after the shoe's been applied and where the bearing surface of the shoe is, you can see that it's quite a bit different. And at that point I had to agree that I thought the shoe should be set back, but 
we did do a, a lot of arguing over where the toes should be. I fit toes. I believe in toes and I believe in purchase, but it's got to be on a properly a, a shoe, that, a foot that can receive it as well. Sometimes we're migrating some feet or, or adjusting where the hoof capsule really is, and then that changes with the shoe application. So the length. We think about length from the coronary band to the ground surface. I, it's also very important to think about the length from uh, a vertical depth, and they should be cut to an appropriate sound length and matching its partner, typically. But what if you have mismatched feet? That's not necessarily going to work. I heard Dusty Franklin say at a shoeing competition one time that he likes the foot to look short from the top and long from the bottom. Balance. It's a subjective element, and the criteria in the competition is usually developed from the T-square method. But that only works when the horse has some decent confirmation to it. So one of the things that we do in Michigan is we try and find the best horses with the best confirmation and best feet that can be used. I like to view the horse from the back side, whether it be the front or the hind limb, with them loaded, bearing weight on it. That, that view of balance tells me more than lifting the foot up and T-squaring it in most cases. Oops, did the button twice. Level or flat. The photograph on the right is somebody viewing level or flat, and whether we swing a leg in or out or whatnot can sort of change that view. So when you're at a competition and the judge is uh, doing a shoeing demonstration or looking at somebody else's job, look at the way they're holding the limb. And when you look at your own work, hold the limb the same way the judge is going to hold it so that you have a, um, a more consistent view of that. The sole should be paired if necessary, to an appropriate sound depth and not be weakened with excessive pairing or rasping. We should only be removing the parts that are exfoliating, and then we need to remember to remove the seeded corn. I see a lot of bruises in, in seeds of corns. Um, not in my own work. I, I'm sort of a stand up my bars, relieve the seeded corn. That's sort of where I start a lot of my trims is frog seeded corn bars, and then I continue around. I attended a contest in Kentucky many years ago, and Bob Marshall was the judge, and he had um, made comment about one of the things he sees primarily as a lameness issue in his area was um, tenderfootedness, too short. And all of the people that listened or heard him comment, I didn't see any one of them with their knives out. They just wear crushed the soles. So it's important to sort of have an idea of where your judge is from. Do your homework about the judge. Find out what their style of shoeing is, whether it's a, a barrel racer or a long-footed horse, will really make a difference on their perspective or what they're looking at for length and sold and things like that. The frog should only be trimmed if necessary. The the frog to me has a huge job in a ground receptor um, circulation. It's a huge traction device in the foot. And the more we trim it, the less traction we have. There's two different ways to trim a frog. Stand your knife straight up or lean it at an angle of some sort. And I think that the foot dictates which way you trim it. If it's a tight, upright foot, probably your knife should stand straighter up. If it's a big round foot, the bars are sort of laid out, more of a beveled foot uh, trim to it. Anything that's loose or jagged should be removed. We trim the frog for hygiene. And I always try and think about when the foot's on the ground and it's loaded and the frog's expanding and the hook is expanding, what does the frog do? And I try and think of when the frog is in action, what do I want that frog to be? Dishes and flares, a lot of times when I'm trimming feet, I take off the dishes and flares first before I ever go to the bottom. Sometimes taking a 
trim off the bottom and then removing the dishes and flares, you can find out that your, your feet end up shorter than you ideally wanted them. And so obviously dishes and flares, is, uh, removing them, using the straight edge to check yourself from the coronary band, coronary band down to the ground surface. And these are, these are all the categories or the subcategories that are judged in your trim at a competition or certification, and I do it to myself in my everyday work as well. If they're not going to receive a shoe, I might be even more generous. And depending on the environment that they're working in or, or living in, might have an effect on that as well. So then you go into the category of the shoe forging and fit level. Just like Austin was saying, everyone looks at level first. Is it level in all aspects? There's a few instances when in your everyday work you might not want a level shoe. Scott Lampert, uh, he shot in Minnesota for a long time. If you've ever listened to one, one of his presentations, he hardly ever put on a level sh shoe. He'd have some sort of a, almost a, what did he call it, an enrolled heel or something that the foot would kind of roll into a heel and then back out over the breakover point. I don't know about the banana shoe. That one's not level and I don't, I'm not going there. Most of my shoes are level, or flat, for sure. Rocker toes, roll toes, that's gonna be on the, bare, on the ground surface, not the foot surface. So nailing and fullering. The nail depth or the fullering depth should be two thirds the depth of, of the thickness of the material. And the nail head should sit down to the touch mark or the trademark or the rim on the nail and uh, the fullering the same thing. Fullering is one of my favorite tools in my everyday showing as a way of blowing out material to make a wider section. But in a horseshoe competition, as Austin was talking about, maintaining your sections and keeping your fullering maintained is something that they're looking at. And then of course, the important uh, nail location. Nails are properly located from the quarters to the toe and they're evenly spaced with consideration to the hoof capsule. There's a big crack in that. This was a draft horse job when I, I was on a three-man team with Dick Becker and Joe Nichols. I was the novice competitor there and there's a very big crack in the, the draft horse foot. So we accommodated for it as you would do in your everyday work as well. You actually will get extra points at a competition if you nailed in a crack, you would lose points for that. The location of the nail at the toe, it was described to me, to me by Roy Bloom that the inside leading corner of the nail hole should be parallel across the inside web of the toe. And, and Austin was talking about that rat and dialing it in we would want the inside leading corner of the nail hole to be along that, that perpendicular line. And then of course the quarters at the quarters, which is the widest point, and then equally spaced, whether there's three, four nails in the shoe. And the nail hole position is gonna be where it is within the web of the shoe, from the outside to the inside. And then the horse's foot is going to dictate where that placement is going to be. At a horseshoe competition where you're building tool, uh, shoes for a table, a lot of times the judge will want you to put them right down the center of the stock because if you can put it right down the center of the stock, he knows you can put it wherever else it might need to be. The clip fit, the clip should be thick at the base and taper to a thin peak, not sharply pointed, and they should be absent of cold shuts and of, of appropriate source hole. You shouldn't have a great big source hole and wheeling, wheeling clip or, or vice versa. Uh, you would be able to get a big clip on a small source hole. And in the instance of pads or something, you're going to have to adjust that, that height of that. Typically, the clip should be as high and as wide as the stock web is thick. Or, or stock web is wide. I think that there's a lot of different ways for clips to be fit. And the manufactured shoes have a lot of different ways that clips are put on them whether they're inside the web of the shoe or whether they're outside the web of the shoe. And if they're inside the web of the shoe, I certainly want to burn that into the hoof wall and create 
a little window or a key where the, the clip fits in nice and flush, where you can run your hand over it just like your clinches and not even feel it. But there's horses that I can't burn. And in that case, I still want the clip. I want that shoe that has the clip outside the web. So I'm better off to have, it's hard to pull the clip and then push it outside your web, but I certainly don't put it back in. And then there's always the option of notching and rasping in, in clips, which I do a fair amount of that at times. Heel expansion and length. Expansion is established from the widest point of the foot back. And the length will vary depending on the shoeing style that's being done. And anything that's outside of a dime's width is supposed to be boxed or saved off. And the same thing would go with, with the heel length. This is another example of how horseshoe competitions have been evolving in it, where they're putting more hunter fits and uh, coffins, roadsters on the shoe, on the feet, and the heel expansion and length varies with those. The fit is going to be from the widest point of the foot forward around the hoof. And I saw somebody comment that to show your true fit, you should take your photographs before you clinch that to, sh to show that you didn't remove additional hoof wall when you were clinching it. So, and I just took this picture last week and I was kind of disappointed that I had a really good foot. And I'm gonna take a picture of this one I can use in my slideshow. And then when I loaded it onto the computer, all of a sudden it looked really long. So there's a certain amount of education you should do on photography and how to take photographs of feet. Because when you use those to go back and look at, you might not get the exact image that you had in person. So I have to, I have to up my, game, my photography game. The forging is basically the forging of the shoe and maintaining the stop as Austin was talking about and that the shoe is finished smooth and there's no sharp edges or burns, hard hammer marks and the stock's been maintained both in the width and the thickness. Nailing and finish is the next category, the last category and we want to look at the height of the nail from the medial side to the uh, lateral side that's what the horse owner sees too. And they don't know why they like the symmetry from side to side, but it, they, they won't know the difference of why a nail is high or low, but it is very symmetric and it's pleasing to the eye. And to us, we know that when our nail height is the same from one side to the other, it definitely directly is affected by our fit quite often. And the alignment is going to be how the nail, the clinches are aligned with each other and in relationship to the whole rest of the hoof capsule. So ideally they're going to be two thirds the way down from the coronary band or one third the way up from the shoe. So if they're in a, from the coronary band you're going to have an ascending line to the toe and if they're from the ground surface you're going to have a straight line, which I like more. But either one would be considered correct. The clinches should be square. They should be as long as they are wide and deeply set into the hoof wall to maintain the strength of them. And, and they shouldn't be weakened with the rasping. Or windswept. I have a habit of windsweeping my, my clinches. When I pull them down, they don't fold down into a nice square they'll have just a little bit of a, a trapezoid shape to them. So I, I constantly have to watch myself for that. Wall contact is gonna be how much shoe you have contacting your hoof all the way around. And you don't wanna see any daylight moments underneath there, or a place where you can slip some money to bribe the judge under your heels. And then sole pressure, we don't want sole pressure but there's a difference between sole pressure and sole contact. If you touch your hand to the person next to you, you're in contact with them, but if you're pushing on them, then that's pressure. So one eighth of an inch of sole contact is considered allowable. 
a lot of times they'll slide a credit card all the way around there. And then I've heard the opposite um, argument that you can have too much relief underneath your shoe and it's trappy and it could trap dirt and rocks. I've never had that happen or become an issue for me. But I think there's a fine medium that you just need to stay within. The finish, Austin talked about that, that you, there's not supposed to be any foreign materials on the hoof or the shoe at a competition. Just sanding block, sweat is not considered a foreign material. And uh, of course, you know, sealers or anything like that are not allowed. But you can get that bowling ball of effect, that sealant look with, the, with those rasping finish systems that they use. I'm not, I don't do it. I don't do it in my competition. I don't do it in my everyday work either. I don't even use a sanding block in my everyday work, hardly ever. The shoe position is where the shoe is nailed on where it was intended to. I think this was from a competition in Indiana many moons ago, maybe an intermediate competitor. Um, and the shoe's nailed on where it was intended. It's nailed on where the clips were burnt in, but the clips weren't exactly burnt in in the right place because if you look at the clips, versus the apex of the frog, and you look at the heel lengths, the, sh the, clip, the shoe was initially burned on crooked, and then it was nailed on in the place that the burns were. But the fit was consistent with it, but shoe position maybe was not where it could have been for better points. So when you're at a horseman competition, you only have a few elements to worry about. You can ask the judge how to shoe the horse, what he wants to see in the trim. We try and bring the most quiet, best conformed horses available. There's only a few elements to deal with. There's no riders, there's no, what do I have there? Five different things. And if you ignore, if you go out and shoe all the horses in your everyday practice the way you do at a competition, you're only shooing some of the horses right some of the time. And I think it's important that you understand the differences and that the competition is an arena to develop the skills so that you can go to your everyday work and adapt them for whatever scenario that you're in. And one of the best advice I ever got was from Jim Quick, who's one of my mentors, and he said, Jennifer, just pretend you're the judge. And so I do, every day I try and pretend I'm the judge. But in our everyday work, there's a whole lot more judges than in a competition. We've got the horse, who is our number one judge. We all agree that the horse is the one that matters most. But he doesn't get to speak and he doesn't pay the bills. And we've got a owner, a rider, a trainer, veterinarians, other professionals, or other farriers, who all are gonna judge our work. And society has, is a judgmental area. And we were taught at a young age to conform to judgment. And We've got a lot of judges in our everyday work to try and conform to and please. How many are there? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 at least. Those are the ones I've identified. So the horse judges us by how he feels, how he stands, uh, his posture, and in order to read his skill, his communication, you've got to have good horsemanship. And if you're not a horseman, or even if you are, you can always continually improve on your horsemanship skills and listen to the horse, watch how they move, do they look and chew, where are their ears, are they bringing their tail? Um, there's tons of behavior, body language that we need to listen to the horse. And if, make horsemanship part of your everyday or, or continuing education all the time. The owner and the rider, they want us, they'll judge our work by whether we're winning, they're winning, and they judge our work by whether the shoe stays on or not. And that's a really frustrating thing to me because it minimizes my ability to do what the horse is, is wanting me to do. Sometimes uh, there's things out of my control they're probably the least qualified a lot of times to judge our work. The trainer judges by how the horse is moving. Veterinarians will judge from a static moment, a radiograph, a, a moment in time. And then other barriers will judge us. And they have different skill levels, different experiences. 
and different worlds that they live in. And if any one of those judges is going through a divorce or menopause, you're screwed. Sorry, yeah. So there's a lot of factors that we have to deal with. The discipline that the horse is in. What's, what are the reasons we shoot horses? Protection, enhance a job ability, create balance when balance can't be achieved on its own. And so job description heavily influences how, how we're going to shoot them and what we're going to do. The breed of the animal, different breeds have different characteristics. They have different hoof capsule characteristics, the thickness of the sole, the thickness of the wall, the shapes of their feet. They're all things that need to be considered. Uh, that photograph is from Mackin Island and I shoot both Frisian horses there and these were some Dutch harness horses I was shooting there. I only shoot probably a dozen horses on the island. I, I just work for some private accounts. But the way I shoot the Frisian horses is a whole lot different than the way I shoot the Dutch harness horses based on their characteristics and the way they move too and how hard they are on, you know, how animated they are and how hard they can because the ground makes a big difference on what, and many other factors, which I think it will go into them. So confirmation, obviously, is a huge factor. The entire horse needs to be evaluated, not just the, the foot or the limb, but the entire horse. I think there's a confirmation lecture later on this week I'm looking forward to. The footing that they're working in makes a huge difference on, on what you're going to use to shoot them with and the effects that they'll have. I get a lot of that top left where it's a frozen ground with just the light snow. Then I'll also get um, deeper snow. And the snow can be different based on the amount of moisture or the weather. Sometimes we'll get a real fluffy snow. Sometimes you get a real wet, packy snow. Sometimes I'll get snow that's like little ice cubes, little, little ice balls, and each type of snow will be different according to whether a snowball rim pad will work better, or whether a bubble pad will work better. I shoe on uh, asphalt, those are my Frisian horses going up past the Grand Hotel. And then uh, I don't shoe any track horses, so. But I do have sandy areas where I do shoe, and that makes a difference as well. The environment that they're living in makes a huge impact on their growth capsule. Top right is either New Mexico or Arizona, where I always been sitting hard and dry. The feet are hard and dry, the ground is hard and dry. They want as much protection on their feet as possible. Hardly ever take out a, a knife. You couldn't trim it if you tried. Um, I see a lot of mud. The top right was taken on my cultural exchange, and I was happy to see that when I went to England, they had a lot of the same environment that I have, and they're pretty close to the same latitude as, as I am up north. Um, very wet and muddy. I was allowed to trim the horses at that place there. <laughs> it was one of my first stops, and uh, yeah, Gavin said, go ahead, you can trim these ones. I was pretty sure he was going to fix them on the next go around when it was dry. The photograph on the bottom right is um, Mackin Island horses that I don't shoot, but they, I used to live next door to them, and um, it was kind of cool. They would drive a horse. The horses are turned out all winter long. The feed truck would come out with bags of pelleted feed on the, on the flatbed, and they'd cut those open and just drive and pour out the pelleted feed, and all the horses would come out of the woods and come to that feed line. And it was something I did enjoy about where I lived there. And you can see the teams of horses come, and even in the pasture and, and the feed line, they come and stand as pairs. So the stable management is a huge impact on their feet as well. Sloppy, muddy, filthy, top right. If I had a, a, a horse that was really sore or had some sort of laminatic issue or something, boy, it's cool and it's soft and deformable, but what a filthy, hygienic mess. And even a healthy horse doesn't belong in that. The one on the bottom left, I was um, working for Dave Dawson up in, down in Toronto. And uh, 
when we started the work day, we helped out in the barn first. There was 40 stalls there or something. And I actually carried a ruler in my pocket because if the bedding wasn't 12 inches deep, we were gonna get chewed out about it. And it was nice, soft, fluffy bedding. And, and the horse could have comfort, you know, regardless. They were, they would pillow it right up. Uh, most of the barns in my area, they only put down enough uh, sawdust just to soak up any sort of urine, and it doesn't really do anything to help support the entire hoof capsule. The age of the horse has a huge effect on what we do or the growth of their foot, whether it's the old horse will grow really slow or a young horse will grow really fast. This old horse limited what I could do for him because I was afraid to even be underneath his hind end there at the end. I could put some front shoes on him, but I couldn't hardly hold him up behind. So it restricted what I could do underneath him, and my work was probably not as good on the back end of that horse as it should have been on, on a, a, a better, younger horse. The diet of the horse has a huge impact on us. Obviously, a metabolic or insulin-resistant horse of some sort and just like if you're overweight compared to the feet size you have, your feet hurt and some, their feet tend to hurt too and, and it's an uphill battle all the while. Rider ability. We have good riders, we have bad riders. Young riders are fantastic. They're hardly ever in the horse's way. They're more or less perched up there steering around and, and I love working for children, are my favorite clientele. I also have a significant amount of trail riders, adult trail riders, and they go out in the woods and they go camping for the weekend and they drink. And they are the worst ones to work for because they're drunk. Up there, bobbing and weaving on their horse, and they're throwing their horse off balance, and they come home and they say, my horse pulled a shoe, and I'm being judged because the shoe fell off. It didn't fall off. You were drunk, and you not throw your horse off balance. So that's something I deal with on a a regular basis, I hate to say. Behavior of the horse, whether they're rank, we all know a rank horse you're gonna get in and out of as fast as you can. The quality of your work is maybe not what it you'd put for a competition or another a good standing horse for sure. But what about the lazy horse who's leaning on you the entire time? Falling over, not paying attention, looking at Feed wagon going by, that's all behavioral things, and it has a big influence on, on the work that we can put out. And of course, the working conditions make a huge influence on the ability to put our best work forward. That photograph was taken in England while I was on cultural exchange, and I was there in the, the February, it was last week of February, and it was wet the entire time I was there, and they mostly shoe outside underneath these little overhangs where a lot of times the water runs right off the roof and right onto them. The funds available obviously make a huge impact. If all they can afford is a trim, you are greatly limited as what you can do to help them and, and satisfy all those judges when there's no money to pay for it. And we have to be careful that we don't take on their responsibilities. A lot of times it's like, oh, I feel bad for the horse. I'm gonna go ahead and shoe the horse. I'll just, I'll do it for nothing or I'll do it for less. You're taking on a responsibility that's not yours. And, and I caution you about doing it. I did it for a while. And in certain circumstances, I gotta remind myself not to take on other people's responsibilities. Nobody can maintain a horse if it's not on schedule. Doesn't matter. It's a growing structure. And our job is to maintain balance. And the longer it's growing, the farther out of balance it's growing. And our job is to maintain. So the shorter the shoeing cycle you can keep your horses on, the better off. And when, when my clients read in the book, the average is six to eight weeks for a trimming cycle. They think eight weeks, and then they reschedule twice until you get there. And you're constantly trying to rebuild or, you know, 
reestablish a hook, and you never are going to on that cycle. You just won't. And it, I always dreamed about the trims where you actually go around and, and only take off three eighths of an inch. That's what I read. You're supposed to be trimming three eighths of an inch in a six week cycle. And it really makes your job a whole lot easier. Your body feels better, and you're making the money that you should be making. Again, the veterinarian's input is a static moment a lot of times. They don't see the horse as often as we do, and then they'll take a radiograph, and it's only that moment. And they're gonna judge our work based on that. But we need to work with them and understand that they have views that we don't always have available to us. And, and when we work together, we're gonna both be more successful as well as the horse. And the clients certainly appreciate it when you can get along with the other professionals that they're hiring. There's other professionals, dentists, that have some sort of view inside the mouth that we may or may not have any information about. Take advantage of them, listen to what they have to say. Um, I go to the dentist, I go to the chiropractor. I value those other individuals. Um, expertise so there's a lot of things there to think about all those different factors that we have to think about when we're shoeing horses and how are you going to balance all that you have to be able to think I wish I could stand up here and tell you the answer but each different scenario is going to have a different set of factors involved and it's going to result in a different solution for you to, to shoe the horse and so you need to be a good thinker. So be a big picture thinker. Think about the entire world, the big world that's out there. Make an effort to get outside of your own world and go visit other people's worlds. Make sure that you're learning continually. Never be satisfied that you already know everything. Continually ask why. Visit new places read new books, and meet new people and learn new skills. And then listen intentionally. An excellent way for you to broaden your experience is to listen to somebody who has expertise in the area that you don't. And expose yourself, go places, and let people see what you're doing and let them help you and assist you. It's a big world. Engage in focused thinking. Identify what the priorities in your, in your shoeing job, or your shoeing business, or your, shoeing, or your life altogether. Identify what your priorities are. Identify what's important. And that's difficult. Communicate with the other people that are involved in those different aspects of the shoeing of the horse or, or your life in general. And understand what's important to everyone. Just like Chad was talking about this morning. You know what you have the equipment to use, you know what you have the ability to do, and, and then it's up to you to come up with a plan using those things. Set your short-term goals, set your long-term goals, and then question your progress along the way, and adjust your plan as things change or as mile markers are reached. And the greater the difficulty, the challenge is, the more focused thinking you need to put into it. Be a creative thinker. Even the greatest artists who are considered original, learned from their masters. They've modeled their work on that of others that they've surrounded themselves and to create their own style, just as my presentation earlier. Creativity is about having ideas and have lots of them. Ideas provide solutions, but they, they don't, ideas provide the key to find the best answer, not just the only answer. There's more than one answer to everything. And ideas create a backup plan. I'm going to try this, and if this doesn't work, then I've got another backup plan, another idea. Creativity sees solutions more than they see problems. And as I said earlier, creativity and innovation walk hand in hand. Employ realistic thinking. Our actions all have some sort of consequence to them, so be realistic about um, what you are determined to do and what the consequences of that might be. Plan for the worst case scenario and then you can minimize the downward um, 
influences or, or risks that you might have. Utilize strategic thinking. So break down what the issue is and why. And then what should you do about it and why. Determine how you can be more effective and efficient while moving towards that ideal. And then you bridge the link between where you are and where you want to be. Hope is not a strategy. You need to come up with a strategy. Explore possibility thinking. This is my blacksmith shop. The one on the right when I bought my place. Falling down, moss holding the roof on. The vehicles were, were removed by the time I purchased it. And people were like, Jennifer, you can't turn that into a blacksmith shop. Yeah, it's possible. Anything's possible. And if I had listened to them and believed that I couldn't do it, then I've already failed. I already won't be able to do it. And the same is, is true in, in a lot of our showing. If, if you don't believe you can do it, you can. You need to believe you can. Understand what your options are and how they work for you. Everything has pros and cons. So I'll often create a, a what if in my head. What if I did this, then what could happen? What if I did that, then what could happen? And it helps me refine what and make decisions. Question popular thinking. It's easier to do what other people are doing and hope that they thought it through. And maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but question it, and you're gonna learn a whole lot through that process. Benefit from shared thinking. Shared thinking is faster. Combining thoughts will come up with more thoughts, and sharing thoughts improve, moves you from being in competition with each other to being in cooperation with each other. And that's really important with the other uh, equine professionals, that we're not competing with them, let's cooperate with them and do the shared thinking. Learn from reflective thinking. The value you receive from reflective thinking will depend on how you question it and how you question yourself. You can help increase your confidence in the decisions you make by reflective thinking. And it encourages us to go back and revisit the experiences and the educations and we can see what we learn. One of my favorite things to do in reflective thinking is driving home from a competition, thinking about this mass of information I've just exposed myself to, it gives me an opportunity. Usually my drives were extremely long and I would, I would have all that time to recap and rethink about all of the things. Sometimes when I'm working, depending on my route, I have more or less time to think about it, but I think about the job and reflect against the last time I was there while I'm driving to the next stop. And make sure you give yourself the opportunity to have time to think. So we make all these decisions and all of the decisions are gonna come with a pro and a con and then I have to be able to defend those and back those up. I also try to remember the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I, I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And when I finally reached, I'd heard about farrier burnout, and I was afraid of it. And when I finally hit it, I knew I was in it, and I had to figure out, why am I here? What am I gonna do? I, I don't know how to do anything else. I started shoeing horses right out of high school. What else will I do? I can't quit this. What are my issues? How am I going to overcome them? And part of my barrier burnout was I was allowing things that were out of my control to affect me. I was trying to control things I had no control of. I couldn't control if they were turning their horses out in the swamp or if they were drunk trail riding. I couldn't control that. But all I could do was control how I reacted to it. So I try and keep in mind what do I have control over and what do I not have control over. I also think about the horse like a factory and that the body has all these different departments and all these different structures within their departments 
and I think about all the structures as being like little workers, and if at one point one of those workers calls in sick to work or quits doing their job or is completely failing, the rest of the workers in that department have to make up for the guy who's slacking. And, and when I am faced with language issues or trying to rehabilitate a hoof capsule or, or whatnot, if I describe it to my clientele in very simple terms like that, it helps them to understand, okay, we're gonna take all the job away from the wall right now from the, the whole front of the toe that's not working and we're gonna transfer that to the back, back there where the heels and the frog are. And I can kind of get them to understand a little bit better about some of the strategies and the shoeings that I'm trying to, to work with them with. There's a reason it was done wrong. We can be so critical and so judgmental and not understand the reason it was done wrong. Sometimes it's not done wrong, but somebody may view it as being done wrong. Sometimes I do things wrong, but I learn something from it. A lot of my artistic things, I, I go to try and achieve something, and I did it wrong, but I also discovered something else that was new or different that I hadn't seen before. So be careful about um, just judging in general. It's to your advantage to find out why people do things the way they do that, and why they don't do things that they don't do. If you have that understanding, you'll have a better leg up. So one final thought, um, the more education you can gain, the more skills you can build, the more tools you have between your elbows, the more options you have to choose from, and the more solutions you can create, and the more success that you can then achieve. The common sense, I put a little meme or whatever they're called down there. Try and find your common sense. <clears throat> and be persistent. This was on my slide earlier, the creative forging, and uh, I, I use this scorecard inside my head as well. I try and remember these categories when I'm doing my barrier work. I think most of the categories can apply, um, especially the choice of materials and the function are huge. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I had a different picture there. Persistence. Be persistent. These are my number one priorities, my family. My two boys there, they're 28 and 26 now. That's the best thing I've ever made. Thank you.